And here we go. Admitting everybody. Well, welcome everybody. Today is, uh, what is today? March 2nd, 2022. And welcome to AOPA's Flight School Connector. Uh, today, we've got a great topic we're really excited about. It's simulation implementation, using a simulator to help your school business. And uh, so, of course, my name is Chris Moser. I work at AOPA, helping flight schools and CFIs. We've got Steven Schroeder with us, always behind the scenes, running everything, although he's sort of in front of the scenes here on the connector. And our special guest today, um, Josh Harnagolf, the Vice President of Marketing from Redbird Flight Simulations. So, Josh, thank you for being here with us. We're really looking forward to um, your insight on how to maximize a sim. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited. Cool. Um, all right. So before we get started, a couple of uh, sort of, I don't know if it's quite housekeeping items, but um, we just did want to thank our sponsor, Sporty's Pilot Shop. If you are running your flight school and you're interested in starting maybe like a pilot shop, a supply store, that sort of thing, Sporty's has a program that might be for you. It's Sporty's Dealer Program. You can see the details on the slide and the website right there, sporties.com slash dealer. So today, what we're going to talk about is uh, really about how you can use a sim from the business side of it. I know you've probably seen lots of information about you know how to instruct in a sim and how to use those, which Josh is um, very experienced and can talk about those things as well. But today, we really wanted to focus on the business side of it. So we're going to talk about changing your frame of reference, how to fund getting a simulator, um, maximizing the utilization, and then uh, at the end, we might cover a couple of teaching tips from Josh's experience because he has done this quite a bit. Um, if, by the way, if you just make sure you keep yourself muted during our presentation today, you'll see a little microphone. Just make sure you click that and you'll see a little slash through it when it is muted. And then the other part, you've got two other features uh, you want to check out in Teams here. One is the little bubble, and that's where you can ask questions. We'll be uh, sort of answering questions as we go, and we'll have a Q&A at the end as well um, as appropriate. And then finally, uh, if you had really something, like especially towards the end, and you wanted to ask us something, you can raise your hand, and that'll let us know that we want to take a look at either your question or if you're going to maybe uh, turn on your camera and talk to us. So let's get moving. First, let's start off with a poll. Um, what we'll have you do is in the chat function, if you would, tell us a little bit about your ex school's experience with a SIM. And you can just type in either A, B, C, or D uh, in the chat there. And that's that little bubble that looks like a little cartoon bubble. Is your school's experience that a SIM is a great teaching tool and it helps grow the business? Or is it B, I wish my CFIs or customers would use it more? Could be C, uh, it's just not paying off, or D, we don't have a simulator, but maybe we're here and we're interested. So if you would, just in the chat function there, just tell us the, what your choices are. And Josh, while we're um, having given people a moment to put those in, we're seeing those come in the chat there. What do you, what do you typically see from schools that you talk to um, from your vantage point at Redbird? Yeah, so um, again, thanks to everybody for joining today. I'm um, real happy to talk about this. This is actually one of my favorite topics um, because it, Really, it, it shows we can really get into the meat of why the simulator is effective in a flight school environment. Um, but you're, the flight schools are really divided. I mean, it, let's, assuming they have a simulator, um, somebody made the investment in it at one point. Um, it's, there's a segment, there's a, a group of them that are um, very much in the A. You know, it's a great teaching tool. It, it really works well for the business. And then um, probably the majority of flight schools probably fall somewhere in the B, C category. Um, and it just depends on how long they've had the simulator, whether they're B or C, right? So <laughs> if, you, if you've had the simulator for a couple of years and it's not really going all that great, you're in the B group. If you've had it for a decade and it's still not going great, it's in the C group. You know, that's just a, a scale. Um, but I think, you know, that there are, the, there's, <clears throat> there's nothing about, um, flight school other than the the way it's managed the way the the um, owner operator thinks about the simulator and how they use it how they integrate it that that's the real difference between whether you're in the a group or the b group from for the most part um you know i'm obviously from redbird i'm i'm for our simulators i think everyone should get a redbird we'll say that <laughs> to start with but the truth is there's a lot of simulators out there that we have competition that make really can make really nice products that fit needs that maybe we don't even fit. Um, and the best thing is that you just take advantage of the the equipment that you buy, the the asset that you get that you put in there. And and a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today applies 
you know, to Redbirds to, to not Redbirds. Um, and um, really the, the, the best part of this or the, the exciting part for me is that the difference between it just not paying off and it really helping the business is it's about policy and, and, and integration in the curriculum, stuff like that. It's not, um, it's not, I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm just, it's not like you need to necessarily spend a bunch of money or you're in the wrong location or there are things that are outside of your control. And most of it is in your control as the owner or operator of a flight school. Cool. And then Josh, um, I, just to let you know, too, I was just looking through the, the people's responses, and mainly we see lots of Bs and Ds, a few sprinkling of As in there, just like you said. It's just kind of like you predicted. Um, didn't see many Cs, though. So it looks like people either have it and they want to use it more, or maybe they don't have one yet. And so um, this is going to be, I think, a perfect presentation for them. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and we'll jump to our, our first slide, which is the frame of reference. And it's really, and I, when we were doing some brainstorming on this, Josh, you really talked about the first thing that came off of your the top of your mind was you got to view this in a different way. And so can you can you enlighten us a little bit about like what it is, like how people should be looking at the sim versus what you normally see? Yeah, so um, what you typically see in, in your average flight school is that the, the flight school owner um, and I'm going to say owner from now on probably, but I mean owner, operator, like it doesn't really matter. Whoever's got P&L responsibility for that organization, um, the biggest assets on their books are the airplanes. Um, either they own some airplanes or maybe they lease them back. Um, and those, um, they feel a lot of kind of responsibility towards those airplanes to have them generate revenue. Um, and a lot of times the flight school will do its accounting in a way that ties revenue, a specific revenue number to a, a specific airplane, uh, a specific tail number. And they have to do it that way because of leasebacks in a lot of cases, right? The, you know, they, they get a percentage of the revenue that that airplane generates. The rest goes on to the, to the owner of that airplane. Um, and so when you put a simulator in that environment, they tend to, your average owner is going to look at it in the exact same way. That it's just a, you know, it goes in the scheduling system. It's another tail number. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, it's just another tail number that is being tied to a specific revenue, um, number and they focus on recouping the cost, you know, of that, um, of that asset. But we, what I would encourage people to think about it is less as a specific, um, revenue driver and more as a tool to deliver your product. And this is kind of a bigger topic, but um, the a flight school's product is not one hour of flight training, right? It's not, you know, a billable hour in a flight in a simulator or an airplane with an instructor is not the product. The product is a certificate, a rating, um, a flight review. It's the end goal, right? Your product is um, you are selling um, that end goal. That's why somebody signs up. You know, it's not for unless you are in the business of giving rides, which is a different business model. Um, but if you're a flight school, your product is the is the end goal and the simulator can fit into that in a different way. Um, so, you know, you can that allows you to think about things in terms of training for or, or scheduling for, um, you know, short time. So maybe it's a 15 minute session before every flight you do in the simulator and it's a small it may be a small revenue number. Um, but you're you're delivering a better product to your customer and you're getting more utilization out of the simulator. Um, and it's you can think about pricing in different ways. You can do block time. So, you know, X number of hours for X number of dollars or what I personally prefer is a flat fee for three months. And it's as much time as they want in the simulator, um, the sim by itself. Um, and what you what you're looking at trying to do is get them in the sim as much as possible. Um, we can talk about it more on the when we get into the training topics, but right. if you get them in the sim as much as possible, they have a better experience. They're going to learn more, be able to um, advance more quickly through the training, have a better experience in your school. You'll be delivering a better product, a better pilot at the end of the day, and the sim itself will generate will will be a, a much higher margin dollar generation tool than your airplane. Um, in general, the, the airplanes, um, you know, and these are kind of rough numbers. You, we sort of, we do a study called the state of flight training that that we uh, will publish or have published in the past and we'll publish again soon. 
that kind of gets some numbers of what people are charging and what their costs are for these different things. But in general, you're probably talking about one and a half X um, the cost, the, the margin dollars for an hour of uh, sim time versus the airplane. So just to use rough numbers, let's say you make $30 an hour uh, flying an airplane, just for the airplane, not for the instructor. Your average um, flight, if you're making $30 an hour, you're probably going to make somewhere around $45 an hour um, in your simulator. So while the revenue, you might be charging $130 an hour for the airplane and only $70 an hour for the simulator, but your revenue, um, your revenue will be lower, but your profit will be higher. And at the end of the day, from the P&L side, that profit contribution is what really matters. Um, I, I see just like a, a couple of quick questions about uh, what other schools are charging for the sim. So um, that's in that state of flight training report. Your average flight school is charging $75 an hour for an AATD, like a Redbird FMX. Um, for a BATD, like a TD or something like that, it's probably about $40 an hour. Um, another kind of rule of thumb that we've used in the past is take the hourly rate of a wet 172, 172 with fuel, and cut it in half. Um, and that's a good sort of ballpark figure that can be adjust, adjusted. You know, places like Palo Alto, they charge a lot more um, than some place in like Ames, Iowa. Uh, so, it, you know, you kind of have to adjust to your market. But that's the, that's the sort of rule of thumb. Um, and is, Josh, is it typical for a sim to just have a, a flat, like a, a fee from the company? I mean, obviously, I know you know what Redbirds are, but is it typical mm -hmm. so that when you talk about doing that pricing? Yeah. So I know I'll tell you what Redbird does. We do um, a service agreement um, that's billed by the hour in the rears. So let's say it's seven dollars an hour for service. So you you fly with a student, um, you charge them seventy five dollars. You have to pay for electricity, you have to pay for space, maybe recoup the cost of your capital, and then you pay us $7.50 for that hour. And it's billed at the end of the day uh, or at the end of the month. So it's cash flow positive. It's not like you have to pay ahead of time. I have heard other SIM manufacturers will do like 5% of purchase price um, at the beginning of the year, stuff like that. Um, I honestly, I don't know um, <clears throat> because the our model is a lot easier to handle on the flight schools because it's not like you have to write a check before you deliver the training um, and it's really you know scalable if you do 10 hours in a month we're only going to charge you 75 bucks if you do 100 hours in a month month it might be 750 bucks but um or you know whatever the math is there and uh, so you're <laughs> sorry <laughs> i did that math wrong uh, so um you know if you're um it, it scales to what you need um but in you know, in general, that sim, that hourly or that the service cost on the sim is much less than the maintenance reserve you'd be applying to an airplane. I mean, there's no hundred hour inspections. The engines don't need to be replaced. In truth, even with our sim or any other sim, you should probably put aside a little bit more than that, um, with, you know, like a dollar an hour into a maintenance reserve for things like a computer upgrade, because that, right. that typically wouldn't be covered. And you'd need one of those every five years or so um you know five to six years seven years depending on the computer and the manufacturer but um you know so there you, there's a little bit more but it's certainly less than ten dollars an hour in sort of operating costs and maintenance reserve on a simulator from for a redbird then and i'm talking about the big ones the, the aatds right and so you can see there in the chat there i know jamie from alaska mentions it's that they're charging 35 an hour um at, at a school there uh, at her airport for a Redbird, and then there's a TD2 in Reno, it's $45 an hour. So I guess, like you said, it depends on where you are. Although it surprises me that Alaska is so low, because I know the cost of living up there is expensive. Um, so the big point, I think the takeaway from this one is that look at it like a tool, like you said, I think that really key part you mentioned, Josh, was that idea of that your job is to provide a, a rating or certificate. So use it as a tool to provide it and don't think of it like the normal airplane. You got to think about it a little differently than that. Yeah, um, I, I, I always, uh... And as an anecdote, I always talk about we have a CNC router in the shop here at Redbird. When we do our accounting, we do not tie any revenue back to that CNC router, right? It it is just a thing that we have to have. We buy it, it gets depreciated, the capital cost gets depreciated, right? But we cannot deliver our product without it. Um, and that's kind of the way you should think 
I think it's helpful to think about the simulator and we'll talk about depreciation and all yeah. that. That's coming up next. Um, and then the one thing here that I know that was a good point uh, on the slide as well is think of that the shorter scheduling blocks that you talked about because you can it's not like an airplane where you got to refuel it, tie it down, all the other stuff, yeah. right? You want to just want to just take that before we go on to the next slide. Just yeah, so. there's actually a whole um, I mean really in depth um, conversation you can do about scheduling efficiency that's a little bit wider than the simulator, but that the simulator enables. Um, you know, if you, if you're the type of school where you're um limitation is instructor time uh, which a lot of schools get into that situation once they get busy because it's hard to hire instructors it takes them a while to train um but you might have plenty of airplanes and you might have a simulator too and so the real limiting factor on your throughput is instructor time um you can do a lot with a simulator to maximize that time so you can have student over you know have overlapping students so that you know when somebody's in a somebody's out pre-flighting the airplane that instructor is debriefing a sim session with a different student um staggering starts you know the way most most folks schedule airplanes is in block time so they'll do like three hour block for a, a lesson of which maybe 1.3 gets actually billed onto the airplane and 1.6 or 7 gets billed to the instructor you could um instead of doing it you certainly don't do a simulator like that, like schedule it in much smaller blocks, like 30 minutes, 20 minutes if you can do it, because it, you know, the time it takes from when you walk in the door to getting in the simulator is a couple of minutes. You know, there's no pre-flight. Dispatch should be pretty straightforward. Nobody's got to look through any maintenance logs or anything like that. Um, and so you can really stagger, stagger starts and, and set up real small, um, real short schedule blocks with the simulator to, to kind of maximize efficiency and throughput and if you can get your students working in the sim independently which we'll talk about some more um, you can really uh, up that capacity quite a bit cool all right let's let's go ahead and move on to where uh, just a, a little time check and we, we went into a lot of detail on that one but we'll keep it moving right along here so the next part of course is that schools are going to know especially for the folks that don't have them or maybe they're looking to upgrade is getting one so can you yeah. give us a little bit on the finances there so um, actually getting the loan is super dependent on the school. Um, you know, we have, and I'm sure every other manufacturer has financing capabilities, like we can put you in touch with equipment financers, um, but I'm gonna just level with everybody here. You gotta have a business for two years, right? They, they you basically, you can't get financing if you don't have a, uh, the, the incorporation is less than two years old with revenues um you know for two years and um you know most of these capital equipment financing companies tend to deal with dentist office and medical facilities and you know trucking companies and stuff like that and so they're looking at um revenue they're looking at profit margins that are much higher than a flight school typically has and they're look and they're actually they're looking at um equipment purchases that are much more expensive than a uh, a Redbird would be, you know, one of the things we challenges you run into is for these equipment finance companies, you know, they want to make a million dollar loan because the their the interest on that million dollar loan is is worth it for their work to do that. Right. If if they're just making a one hundred thousand dollar loan or a thirty thousand dollar loan, that it's still the same amount of work, but they're they're just not as much money in it for them in the interest payment for them. Um, and so there's, you know, you, it can be hard if you're going through just off the shelf equipment financing. Your better bet is probably a local bank. Um, and we have worked with people's banks before to get them financing. Um, you know, for the last couple of years, it's been real easy to get financing, generally speaking, comparatively speaking. Um, and we may be in a part where it starts to get a little bit harder to do that, but it's still available. Um, or you can definitely get lease back. Um, you know, the same leaseback style as you would with an airplane with a sim as well. Um, and we have had a lot of owners that'll do that. Um, all that said is, let's say you get this, you get some money together, you buy a simulator. Um, if you do the things that we're talking about doing, um, when it really gets into integrating in a curriculum, and we'll talk about all that, but um, you, most places you can get net positive within thir three years. And that's, um, not including depreciation or resale value, that's paying the, the note on the simulator 
um, either off or uh, at least getting enough revenue or profit associated with that device to have paid it off. Right. Um, but it's capital equipment, it can be depreciated. Um, and there is a, you know, depending on tax structures and all that, you can get uh, accelerated depreciation, all those sorts of uh, benefits. And we've seen a really high resale value. Um, now again, I'm gonna speak specifically towards Redbird stuff. I, I imagine a Frasca RTD probably has a pretty high resale value right now as well. Um, but, you know, for, for us, for Redbirds, um, you know, we are active in the resale mar market. You know, if, pe if people wanna sell a used SIM, we will probably bid on it. Um, and we try to sell those on, so that certainly supports the resale market. But um, in general, they they retain a lot of value. So when you think about you know taking this loan on, and it might be a significant loan for a flight school, um, you have to. It's not just a simple payback period. You need to think about the whole lifestyle life cycle cost of that unit. Um, when you talk about you know obviously there's a cost to the capital, but you're going to depreciate the asset, and you're in ten years you're going to be able to sell it for you know something less than 10% or something more than 10 or 15% of that um, original purchase value, which is what you would get from the depreciation. So anyways, um, you know, there's there's a very good financial case to just own the asset, even outside of um, the, the revenue and profit you can generate from operating it. Cool. All right. Um, so then, so it gets us like we've gotten along the lines of like, you know, how do we get one and sort of that thing. But one of the biggest things, and I put this up third because I figured that that's, you know, the thing that I typically hear um, is the idea of CFIs. Like they hear talk to schools and the CFIs, like they just don't want to do it because they're not in the airplane. Yeah. So give us your perspective on that. Like what your, your experience has been with how you've recommended to people what to do. Yeah. So um, this is the, this is number one question I get all the time from owners, operators, flight schools is how do you, CFIs don't want to get in the SIM. How do you get them in the SIM? Um, and so uh, to be a little blunt, um, <laughs> fundamentally, they work for you. So uh, you kind of have to get them. You, I mean, management has to prioritize it. If it's a prior, if, it, if, you, if you believe that it helps deliver a better product to your paying customers, then it ought to be a priority in the training that your CFIs, your employees are delivering. You know, I think anyone who's ever worked for anyone has had to do stuff they don't want to do. And this may be a thing that they don't want to do. That said, um, there are things you can do to kind of help that process along. Because obviously, uh, well, I do another presentation called Best Practices for Training. And what the in there, the number one thing that makes uh, a SIM training session go poorly is that the instructor has a bad attitude about it. Um, so yes, you can manage employees and tell them that they have to do it, um, but you, you, they have to be able, they have to at least understand the value of it. Right. Even if they don't want to, they can't just go in there and be like, this is a total waste of time. I'm wasting my time. You're wasting my time and you're paying for it. Like that does not set a good tone to that training session. Um, so you can do some other things. Um, you know, one of the things that we've, I've talked with people about um, is higher pay rates when using the simulator. Most what you're essentially doing there is you're trading some of the additional margin that you get from that simulator time and giving it to the CFI. But the truth is a lot of CFIs are not motivated um, by pay specifically. And so if you're offering them a small 5% an hour, you know, $5 an hour increase in um, pay in a simulator, it might not be that effective. Um, Another thing that I've seen or have talked with people about, I don't know that anybody does this, but I would love to see somebody try this, is um, uh, pay time off accrual for SIM instruction so that, you know, maybe every one hour in the SIM is worth a quarter hour of PTO, something like that. Essentially, all you're doing is giving them a higher pay rate, right? It's, it's the, it literally the same math from, you, from the business owner's perspective. Um, but it just is an, a, bon a benefit that may be in a way that's a little more motivating for those CFIs. So, um, you know, it, it gives them the ability to maybe take a day off and get paid for it, which as a CFI, I would have loved. Um, you know, I was a full-time CFI for six months, six, 18 months and got zero PTO. So, <laughs> you know, it would have been nice probably. Um, 
but that's a that's another thing you can think about. The other one, um, and I think it's just on another slide, um, is think about having sim specific instructors. Um, so you can do things like hiring a an instructor that lost their medical um, and have them work in the in the simulator. Now you can't the student can't log that time, right? That cannot go in a logbook to count towards their rating or certificates, but I think everybody kind of gets the idea that nobody get very few people graduate with FAA minimum hours, and so you can do a lot of that overage in the simulator at a lower cost, and I would argue higher training value, um, with the CFI that's um, not building time, um, whether they're not building time because they don't want to go to the airlines or they're not building time because they don't have a medical. Either of those options could work as a you know a creative way to do that, and it might be able to might be a, a nice way to get a student with a, a CFI with more experience or a different um, background during the course of their training as well. Cool. So some good ideas there. And I know one of the things too that um, I've often thought of is just also just trying to do the part of explaining, um, you know, the value. Like if you do a good job and provide good service to your customers and good training, then you're going to get more of them, which is what you want. So you get a, you end up flying more. And yeah. uh, trust me, I worked those. I would, when I first started instructing full time, it was seven days a week. So yeah, no PTO. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So then we get into this idea of we hopefully we get the CFIs on board. That's what our goal is, and whether it's in one form or another. But how do we really maximize using this thing? Because it was, as you said, we talked about one of the common things we saw in that poll from the beginning too was. I wish my CFIs and students would use it more. And so you've got some ideas here of like, this is how you can really maximize this investment. So you want to tell us about like your ideas here? Yeah, the, the first easiest one is if you're a part 141 uh, school with an approved curriculum that you run students through, um, put the simulator in your curriculum. Um, so, you know, make sim specific lessons on other lessons that are that have associated flight time, put a sim block in that um, time. If you go to our website, um, or if you go to um, landing.redbirdflight.com, we have, or I, I think Chris will give an email, we can send it to you as well. But we have two syllabuses, one for private, one for instrument that are 141 approvable, that are simulator, that simulator centric. So they, they have the sim time is built into the curriculum. Um, and so then it's kind of non-optional. Um, the student has to use the sim, has to um, do those training activities to get through the curriculum. It's, it's required. Um, but in a kind of a broader perspective, if you're in a 161 environment, or even when you're thinking about how to build your 141 curriculum with the sim in it, is uh, you should never do something in the airplane that you have not done in a simulator. Um, that's just like as a as a general rule easy to understand before you do a steep turn before you do an ILS approach before you do a stall do it in the sim first at least the procedures of it right um, there are a few things that I personally as an instructor do not teach in the simulator and they all are pre-solo um, with pre-solo students um, and it's uh, th there's there's some nuance behind it but the basically our simulator, any simulator really, even level D simulators are particularly bad at right at the edge of the envelope flying. So, you know, through the main, uh, through the meat of the envelope, they can handle it really well. But right when you get on the edge, they tend to break down. The, the models break down um, pretty, pretty drastically in some cases. So the places where that matters in pre-solo to me are the landing flare, um, not necessarily the maneuvers, not the pattern or power adjustments, all that stuff is great to teach in the sim, but I'm talking specifically 10 feet over the ground, flying at 60 knots, and you pull the yoke back, and what does that feel like in the seat of your pants? Um, that feeling is something that the airplane is going to do, the sim is not going to do, and I personally think that that's a really, um, I, I use the word sacred, but it, it, it's a really special time in their training for where they learn what that feels like, and they um, and you want it to be foundational. You want it to be really, um, you know, consistently positive. This is what it feels like experience, because um, that's what they build their landing. All, every landing from that point on will be based on that feeling. Um, and I don't want to get the sim involved. 
in that specific thing. But what you can do is teach them how to fly the pattern, teach them how to do the approach, how to what the runway should look like, when their flap should go in, all that stuff. So that when they actually go out to the airplane and they start working on landings, um, they're not drinking from a fire hose trying to figure out how to get the airplane configured. They already know how to do all that. They can get down into the flare and you can really work on the flare with them um, in the airplane and they can feel it. And the other place is right at the edge of the, um, of the stall. You know, I'm a big believer in teaching people Buffett and like airframe stall. How does it feel? What does the airplane do? And the Sims just don't do a particularly great job of that. But again, the procedures to get into a stall, out of a stall, all that is fully available to be taught. But um, I would like to at least demonstrate in the actual airplane what that that initial stall feels like. Um, so that's kind of the, the basics. Teach everything first in the sim first, except for maybe a couple of things pre-solo. Um, and then uh, as a policy, just say no canceled lessons. <laughs> Maintenance, weather, whatever, move it to the sim. If the sim's available, right? Obviously you have 20 airplanes in one simulator, and you have a bad weather day, you're going to some people are going to get canceled. You should buy more simulators. I'm happy to talk to you. But, um, <laughs> uh, you, but um, you know, in general, just don't cancel lessons like don't give. Um, that's a that's an easy that's the lowest hanging fruit. Honestly, is just tell your CFIs if the sim is open, there is zero reason to cancel a lesson um for maintenance or weather right it's like go get in the sim and and even if you can't work on the thing you were going to do in the airplane you can work you can review stuff or, or talk about the next lesson etc um and this is like we said earlier we're talking about hiring a cfi that lost the medical really focusing on, on creating a sim specialist cfi that can work with pilots um and again this is one of those things where you build in scheduling efficiency you create a sim specialist CFI um, and your average line CFI doesn't have to get in the sim very much. You can book that thing out all day, every day um, and really start generating a lot of revenue, generating a lot of throughput um, and, and better pilots at the end of the day. Great. And, and in fact, one of the things I just want to reiterate too, from my own experience, I am a huge proponent of teaching in sims and it's, it's uh, to me, the exact thing, teaching it before you go in, because I've I've seen it and I've experienced it as my own, but I remember my being a student. So I very much agree with, I want to just just put my own my own word on that too, that Josh, I think is exactly right. Teach the stuff in the sim first, then go to the airplane because the students just get overwhelmed and you can see it, like you see it happen. I remember what it feels like. So, yeah. all right. So the st second step of this is um, we mentioned is this idea of independent student sessions though, because you have it obviously with the instructor, but a way to get full utilization out of the sim is to let, try to get the students using it on their own. So I think yeah. you've got some good ideas here and you've got some recommendations too, so that it stuff doesn't get broken, right? Yeah. Or doesn't get abused. So go tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I'm a big believer in independent um, use. And I, honestly, um, I, I would like uh, in a perfect world, I think the sim should be, um, each additional hour you do in the sim um, should have as few um, barriers as possible. So that means something like a flat fee for an un unlimited use. Like, you know, there's places that I've seen do course fees. So, you know, maybe they have, um, they'll, they'll charge like for private pilot, it's like a $2,000 course fee that includes all the curriculum, uh, you know, all the books and all that kind of stuff. Maybe they're, um, maybe a, some pilot supplies, like a pilot supply kit and um, unlimited simulator usage so that they can use the sim through the duration of the training. Um, and then it uh, gives them a little discount on their hourly costs, right? So if it was, they get a 10% or 5% discount on their hourly costs through their training. Um, in a situation like that, now the student, there's no real financial reason for, for them not to get in the sim, right? They, they can go ahead and use it. Um, you want it, what you'd want to do is make sure that they get checked out in the simulator um, early in their training um, so they know how to pause it and start it and launch flights. Um, and you want to, um, ideally, you want to talk about how it's not a video game <laughs> and that when they get in there, um, you know, if you abuse it just like you abuse our airplanes, like if you were on a solo flight as a student and you did unsafe stuff, we would probably not let you fly the airplanes anymore. Uh, if you do stuff in the simulator that would be unsafe, 
you're abusing the simulator. It's not that the sim's going to break. It's that the training that you're doing is un, is not valuable, and you're creating um, a habit pattern of the simulator is a game, which we don't want. We very much do not want the student even subconsciously thinking this is a game, because then it breaks down all the training we want to do with them over the course of their les their lessons. You know. Be, 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 when they get into instrument training, especially, but even if, towards the end of private pilot training, we want to be we want to be able to set up scenarios that force them to make judgment and um, force them to deal with we weather and and manage risks and situational awareness, all that kind of stuff. And to do that, they have to suspend reality and actually think that they're, you know. At their core, have a weird feeling that I'm actually flying, right? I think anyone who's spent time in a simulator with a good instructor that's been trained well, it's probably had that feeling where you, you sort of forget that you're on the ground and um, it, it can be really valuable. If you start early on thinking that this is a game, it's real hard to get over that hurdle. So in the, in the place that it's most likely to happen, there's two places where it's most likely to happen. The, one is independent time where the students are just goofing off in it. Um, and two, the wrong instructor and a student in an airplane uh, or in a simulator, and you can definitely get into a video game. Uh, where the instructor is having them do loops down the strip in Vegas, um, you know that that is we're we're really this is beyond the value of the sim there, and we we kind of need to rein that in. Um, there is um, there are a couple ways to do that. You can monitor the sim usage. Just you know have somebody in the even it doesn't have to be an instructor. It could just be a dispatch person or a CSR or somebody in the in the space making sure. Um, you know that they're not goofing off and the other way is something like red our, our program called gift got an independent flight training which has got you know it's got 33 modules for private and some odd for instrument that are focused on a specific skill and then there's a box around that and if they start doing stuff that isn't what they're supposed to be doing it ends the flight you know and or resets them so it gives some gu kind of guardrails um, and for independent use something like gift is perfect because you could in a situation where the gift is integrated into the curriculum, the inst instructors know what they're doing. You can have a student come in um, an hour before their lesson with this with the CFI and say, OK, we're going to work on steep turns. Um, you did the ground. You, you did the ground module on steep turns. Go ahead and hop in the sim, right. do the gift lesson on steep turns. Once you get a score over 90, come find me and we'll go flying. And they can do 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 practice 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 get scores and then they go out to the airplane they have a good foundation and like you said too that that limits them into just what it is you want them to be working on not yeah so they can't just do whatever perfect yeah yeah all right um we've got we're about uh 37 past the hour um let's go ahead and we're going to talk the last part of this maximizing utilization is the big part like you said too is it's filling in those gaps right and it's being creative to do that um and so i love the idea of we're going to think outside the box here right especially like an fmx box um yeah. and so tell us what are what are some of the things you can do to fill in the off time um so what you're what you're really looking for are um look at your schedule and the times um, the sim is busy and the times that the sim is not busy, or even if, if your sim is not particularly busy, the times that your flight school is busy, um, because if your flight school is busy, you can you can make your sim busy relatively easily with the curriculum changes, stuff like that. Um, if there are times where, you know, a lot of times like 7 p.m. on a weeknight, there's not a lot of flying going on. Uh, there's not a lot of CFIs that are available during that time. Um, and so your sim is probably sitting empty. You could um, offer a discounted rate during those times. So if the sim is regular 75 an hour, make it 55 an hour during those times uh, and low demand times, right? Um, and this would be a great place if you have a non-time building CFI to maybe help in that space. Um, IMC clubs, Facebook groups for pilots, um, creating you know special discounts for them for specific times when the sim is not active. What you don't want to do is invite the local IMC club to come use your sim at a discounted rate and they come in during prime training hours, right? Um, and, and sort of interfere with your current students and interfere with and in at a lower um, lower rate. But if you can block it off into specific times that make sense, um, there can be a really good way to do it can be a really good way to do that. And if you have um, if you're a flight school that also rents aircraft to pilots, to rated pilots, the sim can play a really 
really cool role in that where you, you can give them um, this kind of time again on, you know, especially, you know, in the evenings on weekdays, that kind of play, that kind of time um, and make it like, um, you know, they get they have to fly in this one hour in the sim every six months or something like that. And talk to if if you require renter's insurance, talk to your uh, talk to an insurance broker and say this is a you know, to be a pilot in my fleet, I'm having them do this every six months. And you, I'm pretty sure you could probably get a, 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 um, a, a, a excuse me, a discount on their insurance for that. Um, you know, they honestly, the insurance companies really just want a way to know the pilots are actually training, <laughs> you know. Um, and so if you can give them some sort of, hey, this is a thing I'm doing every six months with the CFI in a simulator, and I will fill out this piece of paper and give it to you at the end of the um you know for each pilot that does it that that's the kind of thing that they're the brokers are really looking for um so and yeah but, but there are you know lots of ways to do this if you can uh, sort of the limitations are you have to figure out how to do access how are you going to get people in how are they going right. to use the sim how are you going to control billing all that kind of stuff so there it's not that this is particularly easy i'm not saying that this is like super easy to do you, you you will need to think about go through and think about all the ramifications of it what, what does it mean to have people in my space in my building at 8 p.m on a weekend or on a weeknight how do i handle that um but there there's opportunity there for sure exactly and then um one part uh, richard brung uh, richard brought up here this is uh, we often get pilots that have had lots of sim time on their personal computers but it requires a paradigm shift some to know that the school sim is a different animal. And I totally yeah. agree. I know I've seen that. I don't know about you, Josh, but I've seen that with students I would start with. And I remember flying with them for the first time and their heads just completely inside the cockpit. And I would just go cover up the six pack. I'm like, yeah. and they fly, fly really well. I'm like, do you do simming by any chance? Like, yep. I'm like, look out the window. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. 100%. But, yeah. So that kind of, that goes back to that best practices presentation I give, but um, if, if it's a red bird, uh, and I'll, like, I'll flip to the next slide, by the way, because that's what we're talking about. Go ahead. Okay. If it's a a uh, red bird, it's an a AAT, one of our AATDs. Have them put the seatbelt on, put the headsets on, um, you know, turn the lights off in the room if you can. Do something that makes that makes it clear that they are not sitting at their desktop computer about to vat sim. Um, <laughs> you know, so headset and like brief the brief it spend three minutes talk about the weather before you get in the flight they've probably never pre-briefed a, a home desktop simulator flight in their life but they will pre-brief a real flight in the airplane so um you know do that in the sim that you know just those small cues that say this is different than what you've done before can help with that um and if you have a desktop like a td or a comparable thing um think about using headsets for that. Think about um, if there's a, you know, is there a way we could get a chair that's more like an airplane and less like a gaming chair? Right. Um, you know, s stuff like that that we could do to, to really draw a line between what you've done at home and what you're doing now. Um, they got a question about ATC integration. Uh, you can do it in an FMX or in a Redbird Sim with uh, live ATC or Pilot Edge, excuse me. Um, it, it can be done. Um, and depending on where you fly and what kind of flying you do, it's totally uh, a great service. Um, I will say it's probably not the best place to learn instrument communications um, because they're, you know, they're real controllers operating, you know, in a in an airspace that's uh, in South, Southern California mostly. Um, and so, if you're not really comfortable on the radio, it's not as bad as not being comfortable on the radio in the real world, but it's <laughs> it's pretty close. Um, so it might not be the best place to do it, but if you are, if you're later in your instrument training or if you're doing uh, IPCs, stuff like that, it can be a really beneficial thing for sure. Cool. Uh, and then up here, we've got the, obviously some other tips here. We, we just mentioned, like you just mentioned IFR training, but I know that both you and I agree, Josh, that it is not just for IFR training. You already mentioned examples earlier using the pattern, for instance, um, you know, to, to practice VFR procedures or even stuff pre-solo. Yeah. But I love the second bullet here you've got. You've got these this sort of like flow. So you want to tell us a little bit about your thoughts here? On like, yeah, so um, we, we ran a flight school in San Marcos for a couple of years that was real simulator focused. Uh, called Skyport, 
And if you boiled all that down, I mean, there was a lot there, but if you boil it all down, it basically came in down to uh, learn, practice, perform, learn everything on the ground. So either computer-based instruction or um, ground briefing, something like that, practice it in the simulator, um, practice it to a level of proficiency, um, you know, that is commiserate with where you are in the training and then perform it in the airplane. It's kind of another restating of never do anything in the airplane before you do it in the simulator. Um, but really, even the sim is a terrible place to learn something, <laughs> right? You, you, the sim is a really good place to practice something, um, but you wouldn't put somebody in a sim uh, and try to teach them a steep turn without ever talking about it beforehand, right? They're, it's not going to go well, even in the simulator. So, you know, the, you got to learn the thing on the ground when there's zero um you know the input level is really low and then they can practice it in the sim and perform it in the airplane um and the uh the that third practice applying a concept in the real world with but with a pause option um it kind of talks about the pause button in our sim any sim is the most important feature of that simulator for sure the fact that you can pause a flight um when someone's starting to get overwhelmed is super beneficial it's abused though um, by a lot of instructors and a lot of pilots. They tend to pause way too much. Um, what you're looking for if you're an instructor is you want them to, uh, if they're still learning, if their mind is still processing, uh, don't pause it. Let them go through it because you, they're going to have to learn how to recover from being behind the airplane in the real airplane. Um, that's a super important pilot skill. Um, and so the sim is a good place to learn that, just like any skill. Um, but once they reach the point where they're they're you know blue screen eyes are locked ram is full the fan their little fan is spinning like crazy right once they're locked out um pause it and then reset like that's a you know, it takes a little bit of skill but as an instructor you should be able to look over at your student and say is this person learning anything right now or are they completely overwhelmed if they're completely overwhelmed pause the pause the sim and allow them to catch back up Otherwise, let them keep going through stuff. Um, this the example in here is one that I personally like a lot for VFR because I think uh, everybody, every person who has taught someone how to fly, has spent had this experience of your, you know, there's past solo, you're flying out to a local airport, and they need to enter the pattern, and they can't figure out how to enter the pattern. How do I enter our midfield downwind? Where am I in relation to the runway? Where's the wind coming from? And if you're a good instructor, you sit there patiently twiddling your thumbs as you drive 10 miles away from the airport before they actually turn back to come and do what they need to do. And it, for me at least, that's a frustrating experience. <laughs> so um, one of the things I like to do is really just do a lesson focused on pattern entries or, or, or airport entries, airport environment entries, where you set them up uh, you start in the air, go to an airport they're familiar with, drop them five miles away from the airport, leave it paused, have them pick up the weather, figure out what runway am I going to land on, where am I, how, draw it out, how am I going to enter the pattern, have them fly it. Do that a couple of times. Um, you can change locations, change winds, etc. But get to the point where they can do it live, where they don't have to pause. Um, and even if they just fly the till they see the runway environment. You don't even have to have them enter the full downwind after the first couple of times. Um, and they can get their head around, all right, the, the spatial thinking and situational awareness um, in real time, it's a really great practice um, and it will reduce a lot of wasted time in the airplane. And in fact, I would say that use that same concept. I know I've done that in the sim too, but use that same concept of thinking outside the box of stuff that I want them to practice. I've done it with, types of takeoffs, short and soft field takeoffs, emergency procedures. I mean, anything you can think of, you can apply this concept to it and it works well because it's it's amazing how fast they'll pick it up. Like you yeah. can accomplish a whole lot in half an hour or even you know 45 minutes or something. Yeah, um, so Richard's got a question about uh, a single monitor for the pattern entry practice. I actually think a single monitor is fine for this because what you're teaching is the spatial thinking. Like they, they don't need to, they they shouldn't be able to need to see the runway, right? What you in the real airplane, they may be figuring out their pattern entry 30 miles from the airport um, without, so they don't need to see the runway environment to do this. They they really, they just need to figure out where they are, what's the winds, what's the runway alignment, 
left hand pattern, right hand pattern, etc. Like they need to do the mental work. Um, the simulator just allows them to apply it in real time. Um, and and so for that, I think it, it's it's fine um, because you know once they figure out where they are, they're going to turn towards the airport, right? Most likely, it'll be on the front monitor um, eventually once they get close enough to it. So it should work okay on a single monitor sim. That's where maybe too using ForeFlight, um, a lot of times ForeFlight will hook up to those kind of or some kind of iPad app, and then that'll yeah. help you with your your situational awareness too. In that situation when you have a limited view, that can be a challenge. Okay, um, what I wanted to do is we've got about 10 minutes left in our session. Uh, I wanted to open it up for anybody that had other questions as well. And one of the things just to maybe prompt some of that and, and is this idea of how do you see a simulator either helping your business grow or maybe not? Um, I'd love to hear that. You feel free if you wanna raise your hand uh, or to type, just type it into the chat and we'll be glad to discuss that. While we're doing that, Josh, did you want to share the email address um, that they could yeah. reach you if they so desired? It was uh, info at, I believe. Yeah, or so um, info at redbirdflight.com if you want to send an email. Um, if you say, if you just address it to me, it'll end up in my inbox eventually. Um, if not, if you just want to talk about simulator stuff, you can send it there and, and we'll um, handle it. You can also go to uh, redbirdflight.com is our website. Um, we have all of our products, but we also have a bunch of articles and webinars and downloads and all kinds of stuff um, that talk about the, you know, these sorts of things, how to make your business better, how to use the sim better. Right. And then so hopefully some people give some people a moment to type or ask questions. Um, and then one thing that I wanted to mention here too, was that we do see the chat is often used in these meetings. And we had a suggestion while at Redbird Migration, I'll say, Josh, um, one of our school owners come up and said, hey, we'd love a, a way for us to be able to continue to connect. So there's this crazy email. And Stephen, if you can throw that one in the chat too for me, but uh, we created a team site that's just for AOPA Flight School Connector. And if you just send us an email at that crazy email address, because it goes directly into Teams, um, we will uh, be glad to let you join that. But do we have any questions? I'm just looking for that. Um, teaching tip wise or uh, things for the sim. And I, I know I saw a question a little back here. Um, I know that one of the things was the idea of when it comes to the resale value, can you give us an idea of like, what would you, what would you typically see percentage wise on Redbirds? Oh, um, or so, on other sims in general, if you know that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know specifically for other sims, um, but I think, you know, the core simulator, not the um, not talking about add ons and that kind of stuff, but the core simulator is going to um, probably retain 80 percent of its value over the course of its life. Um, you you it, on a long enough time scale that the things like the um, computer and even the monitors are um, consumables like the, the computer, especially after about five years, it's doesn't have a whole lot of value. Um, and so you can kind of deduct that out of the cost. But the equipments, the the, the you know, the controls, if it's a motion platform, all that stuff is going to retain a lot of its value, if not most of it. Great. So that's that's good to know. And then the other one was uh, it was determining um, all the discounted rate to make sure you're not losing money. So can you give any, any tips on that? How do you go about determining the rate for when you talked about maybe doing a discounted rate for IMC clubs after hours or when? Oh, yeah. Out? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you should probably have a, a an all-in direct operating cost number for your simulator. And I would, you know, what's what's your, your maintenance, um, you know, service agreement costs? What's your maintenance reserve costs? And then include, um, depending on how, uh, how cleanly you want to account for things. Um, certainly, there's an electrical cost. There's a cost for the electricity, um, most likely, depending on your arrangements there, that you would include. But you might also want to include what's the cost for the square footage that it occupies, mm -hmm. um, and um, and have that separate that from your any finance, any capital costs. Um, so at least have a number of what's your raw cost to deliver um, per hour to deliver training. Um, and certainly don't charge anything less than probably double that, right? So if it's if it's ten dollars an hour to 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 deliver your car, your training uh, or for the simulator to run, don't charge less than twenty dollars an hour for that simulator. Um, and then you can also include, if you want, um, you know, 
depending on how you handle depreciation and all that kind of stuff, you can say, what's my finance charge? You know, what's my, if I had to um, spread my, if it's a 7% a year, 5% a year, whatever it is, cost um, across, I do 2000 hours or a thousand hours in my SIM. Like you could, you could break it that out and get a number for what's my cost of capital um, and then include that in there. But at least don't, um, at least give yourself a 100% margin on your direct costs. Um, and then, you know, you can go from there. Uh, there's a question here about the maintenance reserves um, and the computer. And if you replace the computer, does that uh, affect the simulator certification? So um, that is, uh, I'm, I'm just talk for about what it means for Redbird. Um, when you uh, replace a computer through us, uh, so we apply for and main, maintain, maintain the FAA approval for our simulators um, as a manufacturer. Every simulator almost um, without fail gets a new approval letter every year because we add stuff to it. Um, and anytime we add something to it, we have to submit a new application. We get a new approval letter back um, and that approval letter covers um, all the devices. It, it sort of grandfathers in all the devices that were made before that and it goes out for five years. So if you were to get a new computer, um, it may add some new features and all that kind of stuff. Um, you would get a new approval letter with that computer, or you if you don't, you should ask for one. Um, and that would essentially that create a, a new certification time frame based on that letter. When that letter was issued, you have five years after that. Um, we do, like I said, you know, like we just resubmitted the FMX um, qualification for the FAA last week because we're adding some new aircraft configurations. That'll apply for everybody who's got an FMX now. Um, and you know, the, the, the truth is if you have a letter that's still not, um, like let's say you bought your SIM three years ago, you got a letter when you bought your SIM, an LOA, um, and you haven't gotten an updated one since then, that's fine. That LOA is still active, it still applies. Um, you can go to our website, get the new one, or send us an email and we'll send you the new one, and it pushes it out after five years. But if you have it, if your SIM is more than, if that LOA is co getting close to expiration, we definitely have a new one. <laughs> so please uh, get, get it from us. But essentially, anytime you're getting it from the manufacturer, we're managing the qualification of that. Um, that doesn't necessarily apply or doesn't, uh, is not a one for one translation to part 141. So if you have a 141 approval, you might need to talk to your point of your POI. Um, but as far as the, you know, LOA is concerned, we will issue a, you, you get a new one with your new computer. So it sounds like with a lot of this, the overall theme here is that um, with the, obviously with the certification type stuff or getting the new computer or things like that, you just, you talk to the company. They're yeah. probably going to handle most of this stuff. Okay. You're it's a lot more complicated if the company goes out of business. I will say <laughs> that we have some customers that are in that situation and we can talk to you about it, but yeah, that's a lot more complicated. That's dead. As long as we're still in business, you're, you're pretty good. <laughs> good. All right. Um, well, barring any other questions, I know we're coming to the close of our hour here. Um, what I wanted to do was, number one, thank you, Josh, for being with us. We appreciate yeah. your time. Uh, don't forget info at redbirdflight.com or just go ahead and check out redbirdflight.com in general. You'll find, I think it's landings.redbirdflight.com. Is that correct? Landing.redbirdflight.com has all of our articles and blogs and all that stuff. Okay. And then just check out, if you just look at Redbird, honestly, you'll find it. And I, I know that Josh is always um, very welcoming with questions and things. And then uh, just for next month, I forgot to type in the upcoming topic. For next month, it was it was interesting that you talked about the idea of making the setting almost inside the cockpit to make it seem like you're in a sim. Because next month, we're going to talk about, in your flight school, this concept of setting. The message that you convey when you come to the parking lot, your website, even inside the school itself. So we're going to be covering some things that come from some Disney training. So I'm hoping you'll join us then. Uh, that'll be next month at noon and we'll send out emails about that. And um, other than that, thank you everybody for being here. We appreciate it. And please let us know if you have any questions. You can hit up Josh at info at redbirdflight.com or us at ftinitiative at aop.org. And I hope you'll join our team's thing. So thanks a lot and make sure you have a good day. All right. Thanks, y'all. All right. Bye, everybody.